and have been panelists for us in the past and will be in the future, so I know that there will be good questions from this audience. And I don't want to take much time myself, but I, I do want to ask one question. Uh, Brock and I already exchanged an email about this. I'm someone who works on Iran in addition to other things, and uh, I'm interested in this question as to how much Iran has gained, um, and particularly in Egypt. Uh, Barack thinks that they've gained something significant. Um, I wonder what Anthony Cordesman thinks about this. I, I myself think that Iran's potential for um, more influence in the Arab world is limited, uh, considering how they treated their own opposition and in Egypt, it's a Sunni Arab country. The military will still be there playing an important role. Yes, they've talked about establishing diplomatic relations with Iran, but the foreign minister also said that uh, the Gulf is a red line and that uh, they oppose Iranian, an extension of Iranian influence into the Gulf. Um, so it sounded as if they were willing to stand with the GCC. Um, maybe Barack could amplify on his view, and I, I am interested in Anthony's uh, idea about that. Yeah. Well, let me just say I think it's far too early to make any judgments about what is going to happen in Egypt, and I think that whatever happens, it's going to have a much more direct impact in terms of U.S. access to the Gulf, Israel, what happens in the Levant than it is in Iran. As to whether Iran benefits from this overall pattern of events, what has happened in Bahrain, whether or not Iran has been responsible, and I do not believe it has, has triggered in the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and other countries a very direct increase in their willingness to react against Iran. And that's been very clear from the visit of Secretary Gates and others to the region. I think that what's less clear is what's happening in Iraq, which to me is much more critical. But what's playing out in Iraq is so far from being clear at this point, even to the Iraqis, that exactly what Iran will or will not get out of it is, I think, equally problematic. You look at Syria and you wonder exactly what Iran will get out of that, and the answer is I don't think very much. If anything else, Syria ends up, if the regime stays, with a very long period in which the regime has to concentrate on surviving as a regime, uh, less able to play games in Lebanon less able to play games inside the region. And the thing that I think we also have to remember is that we haven't exactly seen Iran exult in the unity of the Iranian leadership over the last few months. We certainly have not seen Iran move toward economic or internal stability. The fact that it is pushed into canceling subsidies is an issue we'll have to see play out over time. So for all of these reasons, I think choosing a winner or loser at this point is very difficult. But within the Gulf, and particularly the southern Gulf, Iran has emerged as the loser. The GCC states I think are far more concerned or even more concerned about Iran than they were before this. And it isn't simply Bahrain, it's Yemen, and it is Iraq. And these matter a great deal more to the Gulf states in practical terms than what happens in the Levant. Um. I don't think it's much as an increase in Iranian influence as a reduction in resistance to Iran, which will strengthen its relationship with its clients uh, in the Arab world, particularly uh, Hezbollah and Hamas. If we if we look at what's going on with Hamas in the uh, in the in uh, Gaza, uh, there's been a reduction in, in the uh, 
the Egyptian desire to impose, to coordinate with Israel an embargo against uh, Hamas and Gaza, which will eventually strengthen Hamas, which and eventually strengthens Iran. We have to remember Mubarak was an a anti-Iranian pillar. Uh, along with Saudi Arabia, it was the pivotal anti-Iranian axis in the region. As in a counterweight to that, you had the Qatari, Syrian, and Turkish access. With Mubarak now gone, the Saudi Arabians stand alone. And the Saudi Arabians don't like to lead policy initiatives in the region. They like to stand behind quietly in the background and dole out money. Uh, so it's going to be very, very difficult for, for, the, um, for Saudi Arabia to stand on its own. Um, also, uh, so also we look at uh, uh, Egypt's, Egypt's or other relationships uh, with the Arab world. Uh, and, and if we look at Bahrain as a great, a great example, but Egypt was very, Mubarak was very, very close with, with Bahrain and, and, the, uh, and the ruling family, particularly because he saw it as a bulk work against Iran. Uh, so that's where I'm, I'm looking at uh, Iranian, uh, Iran gaining. Uh, that said, it, if it, it's it's uh, as I said in, in my in my talk, it was gaining until what happened in Syria. Syria is very very important to Iran. It's a, it's a game changer in the region if, if Syria falls because it's a conduit uh, uh, for Iran to reach uh, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in the Palestinian territories. So if anything happens to Syria, which would jeopardize that relationship would be very, very damaging to Iran. Um, to move to the Gulf, I totally agree with what Anthony said about um, uh, Iranian interests being damaged there and uh, it's being weakening there. Um, when we, 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 a lot of people here in Washington are overly eager to see an Iranian hand in, in, that, in, in a lot of uh, uh, conflicts and areas, uh, particularly places like Yemen. Uh, we're not really seeing that uh, Iranian involvement in Yemen, and as I said, we never really saw that in in Bahrain. So those are the those are the things that we're looking at uh, in the region with the Iran's gaining some type of uh, influences, mostly because of of removing a pillar to resistance and opposition to Iran, and just knee jerk uh, opposition to uh, Iran. Okay. Do we have a question from the audience? Yes? Hi, um, my name is Santi Ruyastuti. I'm an Indonesian journalist. I'm with a, a fellow with America Abroad Media. I have a question for um, Mr. Basam. Um, I'm interested in your uh, statement earlier that um, the opposition or the protesters, uh, they unite against something, but not sure for, for something. So um, is it possible that um, probably um, there is uh, somebody, like a potential leader within um, this uh, protester that can uh, probably um, kind of like give the cause, uh, what, what, what they're fighting for um, against that? And then my second question is to Mr. Uh, Karim Merzan. Um, oh, how do you see um, our uh, TV station um, just um, sent a team to uh, Libya? Um, to cover, um, and then uh, they just uh, came back um, this past Saturday. But um, how do you see the role of the Gaddafi um, sons uh, and daughter um, in the transitional, if possible? Um, um, are they also rejected by uh, the people within Libya, or um, it's something that uh, probably <coughs> can, they can probably be the transitional government uh, before um, the reform? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is no shortage in Syria uh, for potential leaders in the opposition. The problem is one of representation. People like uh, Riyad Saif, who is an industrialist, self-styled social democrat, uh, lives in uh, Damascus, spent five years in jail after the failed Damascus Spring in 2001 because he was outspoken, uh, might speak for a segment of Syrians but not others uh, as a result of the lack of communication that we are witnessing today in Syria. Others like Michel Kilo, which is a, uh, who is an author, who is a leader of the uh, part of the opposition, of course, in, uh, throughout the past 10 years, also spent several years in jail and is out. 
Uh, he's a vociferous crit critic of the regime. However, uh, he has been advocating, along with many in the opposition, and we're talking about an opposition that was jailed, uh, some of them in solitary confinement, so these are not sympathizers of the regime, but are advocating a uh, pause in Syria and dealing with uh, what we are looking for as a result of a complex set of variables that include uh, uh, domestic and regional variables and basically also the question of where next, where to, if we are just calling for a sort of a, um, uh, a, a regime change. So, uh, so these are just two examples of people who, who agreed or agree on basics. Uh, who agree on uh, the importance of a, of a, of a better uh, uh, leadership, a, 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 who agree on uh, the, the principles of democracy, uh, but they represent how uh, difficult it is to uh, uh, basically come together um, and agree on uh, what, what is needed to happen. I mean, after all, if there is no gravity behind uh, 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 those leaders and that gravity would have come from a lot of interaction, um, you can have leaders emerge, but it's questionable to what extent they would be supported by all factions or all, or, or all um, uh, aspects of the opposition. And I think with the, as more time uh, passes, we might see something of the sort develop, but we will also see other opposition members have, uh, having different uh, opinions of, of, of how to proceed. So it's, it's a great picture. And, and I think um, uh, if I am aware of it, uh, the regime is aware of it. Um, I think that uh, the negotiated solution will imply an offer to Gaddafi that he has to either play the role of Saddam or he plays a variation of the role of Mubarak. In the first case, there is, it goes Sandir what is going to happen. There is no role for anybody. In the second case, he, uh, in exchange for his uh, abdication, for his going away, life will be saved for his kids and the guarantee, international guarantee that, he can, that they can live outside of Libya, they can go away, they can get forgotten, it can, it can, be, it can be reached. But that whether there is going to be a role for, for Gaddafi or any one of his family in Libya, I tend to exclude it uh, at any cost. 